All right, everyone, let's get started. Yeah! We love remixes, you love remixes, so let's mix things up. Woo! It's time to have some fun, ain't that right, Eddie? Uh, hate to break it to you, but he hasn't been there for a while, man. Well, all right, I guess we're still doing it. Let's get all mixed up on this episode of Music Arcade. Hello, everyone. I'm Galen, the sound guy, Firestone. And I am Ranako, the less groovy Eddie remix. Ouch. And uh, welcome to this episode of Music Arcade. Uh, as the intro implied, Eddie is not with us this week. He's going through a lot Indeed. of work and personal stuff. And as frankly, you... who isn't these days? I mean, you ain't kidding. This last week has been rather difficult for me, and I'm a little surprised we're making this work. For those of you listening to the recording session of this, this is a weird time. I'm starting this at almost 8 at night, uh, which we is... We are... In full effort mode. Yeah, we are way out in the weeds when it comes to timing, but we're making it work to get this done. And this came about because we had a topic, and because Eddie wasn't part of it, we didn't want to actually do the topic without him. And we started discussing new topics, and I'm like the only... Randy, you came up with the idea of we just post songs and see if we can find a topic in the midst there. It basically, my idea was to have two points, one song for each, and we draw a line between them to see other things that are related, and basically ritual engineer a topic. Basically, uh, after which I actually am just like the Decided only- Decided not to do that. I mean, yeah, basically the only songs I could think of were both remixes, so I'm like, how about a song on internal, like, in-series official remixes? Like, yes. they have to be by the same composer and officially released for a game. That was kind of our rule set. Or not necessarily by the same composer, but, like, in that vein, right? Like, it had to have basically, an official release. Basically, official in-game remixes and not fan remixes. Yeah, not like, I, I wouldn't have accepted, like, there's a remix, a fan remix of Rules of Nature out there that has Jason Charles Miller on it, and I'm just like, that. Ah. like, yes, it's the same artist, but it's not for any sort of official release, so I would have, I, if that had gotten selected, I would have, I would have actually said no to that. Yeah. But that wasn't a problem, because, no. uh, as it turns out, there's plenty of good things that have had remade or self-referential iterations yeah um let's which talk given, about those. yeah which given our love of final fantasy 14 and yes that will be coming up in this episode yes um is, i mean ed is not there might as well mention f14 and yakuza basically although the yakuza usual yakuza prohibition on this show is nothing to do with that it's just because like we're talking exactly. about it so much on the other show um and with that, I see no reason not to dive into our topic. As we said, it was... <laughs> dive. Good one. Because it's the theme for Sensei's Airborne Assault. Ah. So you're I parachute diving. Didn't know that. Kind like, that's diving. not the title, so... Okay, hey! Great, great segue, let's go! So yeah, uh, Advance Fast Reboot Camp uh, released recently. And uh, when it comes to music, he certainly had big shoes to fill, because uh, the original had some pretty great themes, and I'm pleased to say that the remake certainly does them justice. There's a lot of cool reinterpretation, and every character you play has their map theme, an altered, two altered version, one when you're in your uh, menus, and one more. Uh, drum heavy when you're in the actual battle animations and okay. then those have their altered version still when you have used one of your commander's power which is in this case the version for sensei the okay. yellow comet paratrooper operator and uh, yeah that was basically the one of the best music if not the best music in uh, the original advance wars 2 Okay. And this uh, matches up. It's as swingy as it should be. It's got uh, some very nice little reference because uh, 
after the uh, the power fires up uh, one of the early sounds you have is uh, a bit of a drum that's a bit slower fidelity than the rest of the track and right. that's because it's the actual sound effect for when you activated your power in Advance Wars 2 which he has oh. because he's an old guy so that's their way to put some retro in your retro now um we've talked about the series during uh now playing once before yes um I, if i remember right this is this this was done by way forward right yes that's okay. a way forward remix yeah um i only bring that up on account of the voice cast i i remember that christina v uh she i believe was the voice director on this um quite likely yeah she they do tend to be pretty tight yeah they hire her a lot which is yeah, well, understandable Chris being uh, Chantal's uh, voice actor and uh, some uh, in interpreter yep um that seems kind of like a non sequitur but that is kind of me dialing in their sound team's priorities like they're very they're very loyal to their people um yes now i i don't know who did this remix that was not stated um but i did find myself very uh i'm impressed by the saxophone on this the saxophone sample uh i thought it was oh, very yeah. good it's very fitting and it the yeah. quality of the sax basically does the track it wouldn't have worked with or something that uh, was yeah. even a little bit iffy i completely agree um especially since and this is kind of a hot take i do find the main melody to be a little repetitive it doesn't really evolve in any like significant ways melodically um so having something to draw you in when it when the notes themselves can get kind of droning is a really great really great way to bring the song together yeah, and that checks out, especially given that uh, for the repetition, a fair bit of that is uh, due to the fact that it's uh, from uh, uh, Living the Past. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't Advance Wars like a Famicom game? Like a Super Famicom game? Like, was it that old? Uh, well... The uh, Something Wars f series started with Famicom Wars, but Advance Wars, as the name suggests, was from the Game Boy Advance. But okay. they still had uh, song glues that were only like one minute. Yeah. So that's why they kind of stick, some might say, a bit too close to the original in that way, in order to... Uh, make the reference instead of evolving the song. I remember yeah. there was uh, uh, an excellent counterexample that I did not choose as one of my tracks for this episode because it fits way too well in the next episode we're going to do. I have a similar and problem so I where I had to it. drop my now, one of my now playing tracks because it's going to be an actual track on the next episode. Yep. So but, I get uh, that struggle. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I don't have the counter example on hand, but even then, the piano part I think uh, is a nice way to kind of develop on the on the sax through line and uh, add some texture to it. Right. No, uh, the harmony is where the like, song really does shine, even despite the great sax lead. Yeah, and uh, basically it feels like what they did is uh, instead to make a food analogy. They had a solid, if old-fashioned dish. And instead of completely remaking it, they just added a lot of spices here and there. Get some yeah. higher quality ingredients to throw in there and served you the same dish. There's nothing and wrong I with that. Like, that, I've... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially for a remake instead of, say, a sequel or a spin-off. Well, they're, they're remaking the game, so they're remaking the music, and they're developing it a little, but they're not reinventing it. And I think that's fine. Yeah, 
That's fair. I mean, I don't dislike this song, to be clear. Yeah, exactly. It's quite nice. Especially since it's, again, one of the more beloved uh, tracks of the original. Right. Um, I am just going to call a spade a spade and say, yes, the melody line's a little repetitive, but they found a way to make Absolutely. the song work regardless. Yeah. And shout outs to that. Yup. Now then, let us move on to the next track then and go from the joyful beats to some king level of sadness huh. apparently so this song was actually one of the songs that i thought of more or less immediately after the topic was decided this was not one of the songs that inspired the topic those both come later um but this was one that I'm like, I remember that this song was actually bad at Dynasty Warriors 5. That I did not like King of Sadness V1 at all. Um, um, I think part of it was because it was very repetitive. It was very repetitive, and unlike the song we just talked about, it didn't have any of that spice. Like, yes. it was just very on-the-nose, just guitar riff. And the loop was about a minute and a half, and there wasn't really any meaningful variation. And Dynasty Warriors 5 had a fairly strong soundtrack otherwise, so this one always stood out to me as being egregiously bad for almost no reason. Um, yeah, like, it feels... It feels right in the context of beating Moog by the hundreds, but not in the kind of energy a Dynasty Warriors seeks to inspire. Yeah. It's... Almost more of a Dragon Guard song. I don't know if I agree with that either, because honestly, I could start humming some wild music, especially from Dragon Guard 2. I specifically meant Dragon Guard 1. I mean, that's fair, I guess. Um, however, um, this remix, which, despite the title, actually comes from Dynasty Warriors 8. That's that weird Dynasty Warriors titling problem they have. Yes. Um actually fixes nearly every problem. I don't think I love it, but I have to call out the improvement here. Yeah. Um, it's got a new intro that leads you into the song. The, you know, main riff is the same, but it also yeah, adds a whole bunch of extra flourishes. It's almost like curtains opening at this point. Like, it feels like, okay, this is the Dynasty Warriors thing. You are in a Dynasty Warriors. Don't worry. Yep. Here, Dynasty Warriors sound. Anyway, now introducing King of Sadness the new version exactly and dice warriors 8 actually like it had two modes it had its original soundtrack for the historical routes and then it had all sorts yeah. of like nostalgic remixes and in some cases just flat out taking the song from the hypothetical routes um yeah and this comes from the latter this is the final way stage where you're invading by d castle um which was also this was also by d castle stage in dice warriors 5 but again, that was just much worse for some reason. This time it was not. This time, this time they got it right. And while there's a couple of remixes in Dice Warriors 8 that I'm less thrilled with, this is not one of them. This really improved the songs in ways I appreciate. Uh, stronger it melody is line. incredibly yeah. more rich. It is much more rich. There's a lot more of a tapestry here. Um, and I think that's another thing that kind of bothers me looking back on the original version. It just feels incomplete. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are going to talk about uh, tracks that feel incomplete right after uh, in expanding the topic, but as it sounds like, yeah, that's basically, it's like they had elements of a good song, but not the full good song, and that came three games later. Yeah. Um... And honestly... If that's what happened, kind of, because they wanted the time constraints and couldn't get it to a satisfactory place and then had the occasion to fix things in the past, I am basically drawing a fanfiction here, to be clear. <laughs> but if that's more or less what happened, good on them. Like, again, that, ha that has no basis in reality, but that will... Like, it's not that much of a stretch it could happen, if not for this song specifically, than for any other of that frantic pace of production they were on before they decided the well 
had basically dried for no reason. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I knew I Dynasty Warriors would be nice. I man. knew Dynasty Warriors would be so nice. I feel like we talk about this at least once a month. Like, it's just a, yeah, such a common topic. Yeah, and it's still topic. true. It's still true. Um. But I, mean, I think we're we also... supposed to be oracles here. <laughs> Let's make this work. I, I, you know what? I'm all about it. If if they want to give us a new like Koai's free from that like. Yeah, I and think it was a monster enough... to clothe they did with EA, and now they have Fate Samurai Spirits. that's about to come out, which actually and does look quite good. And they're weirdo enough to announce their flagship, their flagship title like just as the uh, summer uh, big announcement season closes properly. Yeah, I hope so. I'd love to hear more from them. The last, like, flagship title we got from them, so to speak, at least at the Warriors' side, was Samurai Warriors 5, which was a solid game. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that is now a couple of years old, believe it or not. Yeah. And, uh, it feels weird oh, not I got to have... hit hard by the age bats with another of those titles. Uh, well, um, here's hoping we get some news about something. Indeed. Um, as for this song, like, yeah, Dynasty Warriors 5 had a very solid soundtrack, so the fact that this, again, this song was, like, egregiously bad, so the idea of maybe this was a Masa track and a Masa remix, him going back and fixing it, um, is not out of the question. Yeah. Um, so here's hoping. Either way, the result is much better. Not my favorite song on that soundtrack by any stretch of the imagination. That soundtrack is incredibly stacked, but it does its job a lot better than the original version did. And for a final stage, like, that's the thing that I think didn't it come across. It feels like a final stage, yeah. It feels a lot more like a final stage than definitely the original. The original just does not have that energy at all. Yeah, exactly. So, good job, the guys. The original has uh, that uh, grindy energy, like... Mm -hmm. It feels like a track you'd play during a, a stage of Mementos in Persona 5. Oh, wow, I didn't even think of that. No, that's definitely the same kind of vibe. You're right, you're 100% yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Wow, It has okay. that grind kind of feel. Yeah. And they broke free of that while still very much keeping the core of the track there. They did? They did? I respect it. Very much same. Um, and from there, we go from a remix of a bad song to a remix of a great one. This one was almost a pick of mine as well, before I went a different direction, because this is just that, like, impressive. Yeah, that was, I think, one of the first tracks announced uh, before Smash Bros. Ultimate released, and that is the Vega stage track. Yeah. Uh, Vega's not in Smash. Um, no reason, but uh, and uh, that track sure is because uh, sure Ryu is. is in it. And yes, they do pay homage, uh, Smash Bros. to uh, the entire series, and uh, it's been clear as uh, through uh, some presentations that uh, Sakura is a bit of a fighting game head. He is. Um, and so it makes sense to uh, pay credit to a lot of the track. And there will, I think there's basically the entire uh, original Street Fighter 2 soundtrack in there. And <laughs> then some extras. And this being extras. one of the main extras. Yeah, and one of these extras uh, is something that Street Fighter themselves have never, to my knowledge, accomplished. And that's getting Yoko Shimomura to remix herself. Yes. Um, Boy, what a remix it is. Oh my god, I love this song. Uh, Vegas theme was always... It's hard to call any song on Street Fighter 2 a standout because it's just that good and timeless of a soundtrack. Yeah, I, exactly. So calling this a standout is flagrantly incorrect. It's just part of an awesome. Yes. But this kind of but next levels the track in a way that this, I... Yeah. yeah, it earns this place. It's like... It feels like a jump from an old 2D sprite to a beautifully rendered 3D model. Just, you know, it better just... than Virtual Fighter managed to pull off. Very I do. It does an amazing job at 
taking the core and the fluffing up, extrapolating, adding things, working on that vibe, using it as a base, and just going in every single possible direction, yeah. taking what works, and just blasting your ears with it. Yoko Shimabura brought her A-game to this track, which... Absolutely. I, I don't think she really has a B, a B game, to be perfectly honest. She's one of the most consistently awesome composers I think I've ever heard. If she has one, it's not that. It's definitely not that. Um, we finally got those classic Shimabura guitars. Like, the thing about this track that really kind of surprises me is it's clear how her style has evolved, and she's kind of locked in this certain kind of violin-heavy sound. Yeah. Um, And she definitely and, uh, plays really into that on this song. And really to... Uh... And really has the liberty to uh, flex those muscles here. Yeah. It's both intense enough to fit a fighting game and has this kind of melancholic part, especially at the beginning, mm -hmm. where the, uh, the violins are mostly on their own with the guitar in the background. Yeah. Um, it just... It, it... Again, she brings her A-game, and when she brings her A-game, magic happens. Um, it feels full, but it doesn't feel overly busy. Yeah. And then let's just throw in an over-the-top Spanish guitar solo, because why not at that point, for extra awesome? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the guitar is already there. Might as well have fun with it. Might as well have fun with it. We were talking about transformative versus replicative before, with um, Sensei's power specifically. Yes. Uh, this is definitely a case of transformative. Exactly. Not in the biggest possible way, but in a familiar one. Um, yeah. Weirdly enough, the song that this reminds me of from original to remix is the Black Mages version of the FF7 boss theme, Those Who Fight Further, in no small part because it, you know, codified the instruments a little more clearly than what the original hardware was capable of, and it adds a guitar solo. Yeah, exactly. It's... Uh... Uh, I saw that during a tweet from uh, a tweet series from uh, Yuzo Koshiro, who uh, worked on some other tracks, which uh, uh, went that for his work for some remixes, uh, what he liked to do is start with something close to the original, and then once the familiarity and the nostalgia brain tickles have happened, then you start going wild. Yeah. And here Yoko Shimamura kind of does that, but starts earlier, like the nostalgia brain tickles are already there. Yeah, like, so, compositionally, the intro is pretty much identical to the Super Nintendo slash arcade version from way back when. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes and the instrumentation is yeah, a million times cleaner. Yeah, it goes wild at the start. Yeah, it, it doesn't change that much compositionally. At exactly. least in terms of the main hook. This is the guest theme. Cool? Cool. Now, what would... I have a comparison, that actually, that is both nice and terrible. Oh, God. And it's, uh, you know, this uh, trend that, uh, ha that was thankfully short-lived of... Uh, um, machine learning users doing uh, expansions of famous paintings uh, with uh, AI generating things to uh, go beyond what the painting could see. Interesting. Well, this is, well, this is kind of that, except with the actual author instead of a machine that spits nonsense that kind of looks uh, like what's in the middle. Yeah, no. This, this feels... You know, we were talking about completing the work. I don't really think the original Vegas theme needed to be completed, but if, if exactly. it needed any completion, this was Yokushima Mura going back to it and making it happen. And I'm just like... Yes, this is a Vegas theme version 1.999 final, final, brackets free, final. Pretty much. <laughs> um, It doesn't... It's kind of impossible to go anywhere from here, which is... Funny because da -da 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 -da. here comes a new challenger. Uh, I also picked a Street Fighter song, which has a very, which also takes on the arduous task of remixing Yokoshimamura. Uh, specifically, my favorite song on this soundtrack, 
Ken's theme. Yes. Um. Yeah, if I had to pick the best of a good thing, it's Ken's. Uh, that said, this one doesn't do the intro thing that the song we just talked about did. This one actually expands the intro quite significantly and builds up to the familiar riff. Um, yeah. This is probably the most transformative remix we've talked about so far, despite being incredibly familiar. It works a lot on anticipation instead of recognition. It does, um, while still keeping the core of the main track very much alive and present and incredible. Um, I really love the guitar work on this is, piece. And it feels almost like kind of uh, opposite directions in which to expand and flesh out uh, an original track that's like one minute long. Yeah. Um... Although, let me tell you, that one minute is such a strong one minute, it doesn't feel like it. Oh, yeah. Um, like, it was also my favorite when I played on the SNES back in the day. Yeah. Uh, I didn't actually like Ken's theme very much in Street Fighter 4. I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't like... It didn't do it for me the same way the original or this one does. This one especially. Yeah. Um, it's like, I've heard OC Remix do a better version of this song than what 4s did. I think part of it is that in uh, 4 and uh, in 6, in fact, uh, Ken uh, released as part of the main roster. In this one, he was uh, a DLC character as part of a season, oh. which was a curse uh, for uh, Street Fighter V as a whole, uh, because uh, it started with a pitiful roster and basically had to build itself back up to becoming a good game. Yeah, I and, remember it had uh, a pretty spotty launch. Yes, very much so. But what this means in this case is that if you release characters one by one, you kind of have to let each of them individually take the center stage. Yeah. And I think that probably helped needing to make his film feel special in this way. Yeah, um... And I should just say this now. There were actually a number of options that I thought about going for. Um, one was Lucia's theme. And Lucia's a character nobody talks about. But I played Final Fight 3. And I'm like, I remember her. What the heck are yeah. you doing here? This is, again, a cool remix of a Shimomura track from... I think it was actually from Final Fight 1, the song that was used for her in that case. It wasn't 3. But um, I uh, almost went with that. I thought about talking about Bison's theme, which kind of no one really talks about, uh, but that one, that one, my talking points would have been too similar to another song for later. And then I listened to this track and I'm like, oh, well, okay, let's just throw in an over the top guitar solo for, because why not? For the extra awesome. Hmm, that statement sure sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's almost like I said the exact same thing. I'm a sucker for a solo. What can I say? It works very well. It works very well. Like, um, if you're going to play off a Ken uh, in this kind of context where he's uh, got that uh, fight of that, but also that rich guy vibe, mm -hmm. might as well get uh, the Yotes guitar solo on. Yeah, and if and honestly, from another angle of this, if you're going to do, like, not a synthesized rock, but a flat-out rock song, get a guitar solo in there. And they did, yeah, and it's exactly. great. Like, I don't think this one reinvents the wheel in any real way. Like, it's kind of remix.exe, I guess. But what it does, it does the really base well. Is super solid. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's some great bass licks in there, too. Like, it expands on the song in ways that... Well, it definitely feels different from the original. It doesn't feel like... Diminishing from the original. It doesn't feel like it... Yes. It didn't feel like it was disrespectful to the original, which yeah. can be difficult. There are some songs that I've heard internal remixes of that I'm just like, why was this a decision you made? Um, yeah, and then there's the whole Street Fighter VI soundtrack where you can definitely ask yourself, why did you do that decision? Yeah, uh, apparently they went a very different way on the music. You explained this... Uh, Please repeat Basically, for the audience. Basically, all of the music tracks feel like they are backing tracks for 
a good song that doesn't exist. Yeah, uh, I think that's... You said that was because of the announcer mechanic, which is a yeah. cool mechanic, but given the musical history of Street Fighter as a franchise, I am very dubious about that decision. Same. And I wonder if that will uh, be uh, worked back when, the, again, DLC characters come. Because... Uh, yeah, didn't uh, they just announce Rashid? They did, and they didn't go for Rashido this time, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, given the time uh, these uh, games development uh, can take, it can be uh, something that can take a while to uh, adjust, mm -hmm. but we know from a fact that they are willing to adjust if the community seems justifiably dubious about some things, because I still remember their pre-release logo, which they thankfully changed for the release version. Yeah, I remember the pre-release logo. I think uh, it was a, a community member, Brimcott, who said it looked like a notification icon on your app. Oh, yes. And I'm just like, oh, that's not the best move. Yeah. And the one they landed on is very good with the Roman numeral 6 as part of the S. It's uh, good stuff. I don't think I've seen it yet, actually. I Unfortunately, Street Fighter 6 is one of those games that I actually was going to like play, and Year of the Dragon just sucked up way too much time. And uh, as for me, I wanted to play it, but my computer can't run it. Oh, that's not fun. That's very frustrating because it looks so good. It looks so good. I'm not even a fighting game guy anymore, though. I have, it should be clear by now, I have no small amount of affection for the genre. I am all about yeah. fighting games, at least as an outsider. But that game is so good, not only as a fighting game to yeah. fight friends with, but also as a nice solo experience. And just something to dink around. And... Yeah, that adventure mode they teased looked wild. Yeah, it's apparently super fun. I want it. I want to play it. I, I would love to hear yeah. what people have to say about that. That's I want a better soundtrack because it's Street Fighter. And at the very least, if they could just let us like buy the soundtracks to older games and play them when we want to. Yeah, it's OK. Pull an Amco here. Yeah, I would have said pull a Koi because they do that a lot. Like it was like, here, yeah, have old soundtracks. Uh... You can play in your stages. Enjoy. Yeah, the, at least the Soul Calibur series does that a lot, too. Yeah, that'd be fair. That'd be very fair. Um, and coming up next, we have a track that I'm not exactly sure is what's being remixed, because this doesn't sound like the franchise at all. Huh. Well, this is Ados Lair the track from uh, Sonic and All-Star Racing's Transformed, which remixes the Golden Axe level. Well, that explains why it doesn't sound like it's from Sonic. I'm like, yeah, my no, very first line of my Sonic is, track. that makes more sense now. I'm like, wait, that doesn't... It's Sonic and All-Stars. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, it sounds familiar. Like, I've definitely heard this before, but this doesn't sound anything like Sonic. What the heck am I listening to right now? It's a yeah, no, Golden Tom, Axe Tom track. That explains more than one so punches. much. Yeah, and that track itself is amazing and works in uh, in the way this game soundtrack works, which is always fun to talk about because essentially they have this kind of wubby, dubstepy musical atmosphere that starts in a quasi in an uninterrupted way from the menus into the different menus. There's transitions everywhere. Uh, down to the loading screen, which have a cooldown version, which then move to the pre-track roll, where you just have the camera pan over the track, in which there's a preview version, and then that transmit into that transitions into the beginning of the track, which starts with a similar sound and then starts the track proper, which evolves over the course of the track, because th the three laps you play don't have the exact same track as some elements of the track kind of break out or shatter, meaning that, say, a section that you rolled over 
on the first lap could suddenly become flooded with lava, causing you to take the plane mode for this section later on. This sound mixing sounds wild, for what you're describing. Yeah, yeah, they really went pretty crazy on that, and uh, I really like some of the results. This one being one of the most standout, because... Uh, Golden Axe isn't exactly a very recent game. No. And again, that means that they had a short loop to kind of expand. And in this case, I think I'm no Golden Axe expert, I must admit, but I think they added elements of other tracks from the game on the later laps. I'm sure they did. Keeping, um... While keeping coming back to that just very catchy medieval epic center of the Sonic is kind of the exception when it comes to like OG Sega games in that most of them had these very short music loops so like Golden Axe or Vector Man or like a lot of the golden age of Sega Genesis games really didn't have good music and Sonic was kind of the exception, not the rule to this, which is probably why I'm like, this doesn't sound anything like Sonic, what's it doing here? Um, I don't remember, like, the specific context of this song, I'm now going to listen to it again, now that I know it's Golden Axe, that was what really threw me here. I think that's just the song from, like, the first level. Yeah, it's probably something like that. Um, and uh, in the original, he's got that uh, very arcade fighty feel. Mm-hmm. It feels very gamey on top of uh, the the medieval kind of dressing uh, of it. Yeah, the very Um, Frank Frazetta, Conan the Barbarian kind of style. Yeah, exactly. And this one kind of tones down the game part to uh, really pay credit to... uh, Oh, hey, we have a chance to do a cool medieval fantastic track. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. it. Um, and I feel like it works out very well. I'm I'm actually quite a fan of this of this track itself. Uh, I there's a breakdown with the synths of the pre coda that gets very interesting. Um, actually, no, not the pre coda. The breakdowns before the pre coda. The pre coda has something else going on, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I like this breakdown a lot. Where I think that's one of those cases that you may have mentioned where it transitions into a different song because it doesn't really sound uh... like what came before. And then that may be one of the lap transitions, in fact, yeah. And then, yeah, then during the pre-coda, it gets downright ominous, where we start getting some, like, ominous, like, forgive me for borrowing yeah, from TV tropes, but, like, psycho strings going on in here. Yeah, because uh, I think that's a part where you are going uh, in a lava-filled cave uh, when most of the track uh, is uh, kind of circling that mountain on... Uh, uh, what almost feels like rail tracks more than anything else. Which makes sense, given, you know, Golden Axe as a franchise, for lack of a better term, like the way the levels were designed there. That feels like it's on brand for the level, if this level yeah, is exactly. also based on the franchise, and it's not just random here. Indeed. They really managed to, like, this specific track by itself doesn't have as much of the pay homage to the original uh, track. Instead, it really feels like it's using it as a building block to kind of build its own thing with the visuals of the track, with the systems of the game, and with the music it can add in itself. Yeah. It Um... doesn't go off track or go anything crazy, but it's... It's staying there. No, it gets the job done. it's making its thing, and, I, and it's a very good thing, as it turns out. And uh, one of the things that I'm also very excited about, uh, because, again, they seem to go pretty well with uh, their concept and do things that work, and so I wondered when the developers took Sumo Digitals would get back to it, because that's the last of the Sonic and Sega All-Stars uh, racing we've had. There was another Sonic characters racer, but that wasn't by, by them, and that felt very different from this one, and I didn't like it as much. Uh, but uh, they've announced, uh, like, last month, that they're working on an original IP, Ooh. Stampede Racing Royale, that's 
as the last part of the name suggests, kind of a weird mix of Battle Royale and kart racers. Interesting. And I wouldn't be nearly as intrigued if I didn't know who was behind them, because I really like this game in particular, and if they're getting back to it and getting wild, which seems to be the case, mm -hmm. I'm intrigued. I'm definitely keeping my eye on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that does and sound very they interesting. Can apply... Yeah, and if they can apply uh, the idea of a uh, unified uh, musical atmosphere with original tracks, I'm curious to see what that's going to do. But for now, let's get to another Sega property that wasn't unfortunately uh, represented in uh, Sonic and Sega All Stars Racing Transformed. Well, it's... I don't know, that is a Sega game. I, I got caught on Sega as a console maker for a second. I'm like, wait, no, that hasn't been the case for like 15 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what that's what happens when I get Genesis on the brain. Um, <laughs> those were the days. Anyways, so... Um, I'm kind of breaking a rule on this one, but this is one of the songs that inspired the... Um, inspired the topic. And that is Soar from Like a Dragon Ishin, which released back in March of 2023 of this year, as of recording. Indeed. Well, um, the Western release was uh, that, at that point the original released earlier, but didn't have this track. No, the original release, once upon a time, was between five and zero. Um, Which I think would sit at 2015? 15 or 16, around there. Yes. Um, whereas this game released this year and was, you know, their first foray to Dragon Very Engine. Good. It was a very good game. I've kind of looked back on it in a new lens after we've um, talked about this franchise at length and played this franchise Which at length. Which is honestly part of why we're doing that whole marathon thing. Which is why we're doing the whole challenge. Um, but I did find myself in the unfortunate position of having new things to say about this song and about Ishin in general. Um, one of my comments at the time was a lot of my enjoyment came from how the characters were remixed. Now, by this point, yeah. I hadn't met the guy whose boss theme this comes from, which is the final boss of Yakuza 3, uh, he, uh, Yoshitaka Mine. Yes. And Mine had a really and great... so you did say final boss, so clearly uh, Hishitaka is an antagonist, right? No, and that's what made... Like, that was actually the thing. I got that one backwards. I found myself trusting Mine. Like, well, the Hishikata was a good guy, so Mine must be. But if I had played them in order, my reaction should have been the exact opposite. It'd have been like, Mine exactly. was a final boss. Why is this guy on my side now? Oh, wait, he's on my side now, and he's actually awesome. And when you know that and you look back, they play on it so much. They play like, on... Hishitaka looks so incredibly shady. He does but he isn't and i think that as i said a lot of my enjoyment comes from the remixes of the characters um yeah. but also of the music uh i've been making it a focus to really collect and listen to and analyze the soundtracks of these games and this is you where i need to pretty put... impressive uh, uh collection work yes given that some of those soundtracks do not have very orderly releases. No. Uh, Yakuza 5 was a disaster area. Yakuza 4 has a whole um, extra CD of B-sides, which are like weird random songs they play in shops, but also extra karaoke tracks. Huh. Um, and then most importantly, again, uh, was the whole Ishin remixing thing. I did discover that... Uh, of all things, when I was doing the soundtrack, one of the singing bar songs from Ishin got remixed for Kiwami 1 as an alt-rock yeah. track. And I had to stop and go like, wow, I kind of wish I played Ishin before I played this game because that would have been a wild discovery. And instead, it was just some song I heard in Kiwami 1. Yeah. Um, now, at the time... Again, this is where I put my foot squarely in my mouth. I had to re-assess uh, just about the entire soundtrack. At the time, I called Ishin's soundtrack weak. And I did so because I played it right after 
Kiwami 2, which was an exceptional soundtrack. And there's... With an unexceptional soundtrack release. And, oh boy, that soundtrack release was a nightmare. Um, I've talked about this a couple of times, but we'll go ahead and talk about it again for those new to the show. Uh, for some inexplicable reason, unlike every other soundtrack in the franchise... Um, Kiwami 2 had an incredibly truncated release where the vast majority of songs were utterly unavailable. Um, focusing only on the in-story boss tracks and Majima Construction album, and as it turns out, several songs from Kiwami 1 for no explicable reason. Uh, Pray Me Revive and, uh, Ogre Has, er, uh, Ogre Has Returned was 3 and Ogre Is Reborn was Kiwami 1, I believe. Yes. Uh, those two made it out of the Kiwami 2 soundtrack for some inexplicable reason. I don't understand why that happened. Especially given they were both present mm. on the much more robust Kiwami 1 soundtrack. Incredibly uh, weird. But, but yeah, yeah that's, uh, I think the point here, to get back to it, is yes. that uh, in its original release, it came before Yakuza 0, which has a stellar soundtrack. Yes. And in the uh, way we played it, it came after we played Kiwami 2, mm -hmm. which gave us Outlaw's Lullaby. Which gave us Outlaw's Lullaby, it gave us the uh, clan creator music, it gave us um, some really the incredible boss Fever themes. Like, yep, it gave us Fever... Uh, I didn't like Fever Time that much, I liked uh, the Cabaret Club GP boss music. Was my favorite oh, from that one. Music, right. Um, right, right, and right. that it gave us uh, Update with Gunfire, still one of my favorite boss tracks to this day. So the timing of Kiwami... And a very cool name. And a very cool name. The timing of Kiwami 2 was a little awkward. Or sorry, the timing of playing Ishin and analyzing its soundtrack was a little awkward. Um, it also was... A, I, I also had to kind of stop my assessment because... One of the things that happened between the 2016 or 2015 re version of Ishin and this new 2023 version uh, was that several characters were actually added from their original uh, versions. Yes. So uh, back in the original version, the character of Ito was played by Go Hamazaki, who we know from Yakuza 3 and 4. Uh, in this Indeed. version, he was replaced with... Um, with Daisuke Kuze, one of the most iconic bosses, which came historically one game later in Yakuza 0, and whose boss music is quite literally the best song of the entire franchise, bar none. Like, it's not even close. It is close. I am uncertain on that. Okay. Yes, some of the track of Like a Dragon are that good to me. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing that soundtrack then, because that's, that's some high praise. Um, yes. I've grown to really appreciate this the soundtrack's music, and I still hold uh, Pledge of Demon above all of it by a fairly, by a country mile, really. Um, so, when Kuze was added to the game as Ito, they didn't bother making a remix, they just played Pledge of Demon. Yes. And to me, that overshadowed the soundtrack unfairly, as it turns out. Because another thing they did was that they also added several new songs that were not originally present in Ishin just to, just to fill space which was with what used to be regular boss music. Uh, there were four songs in particular. Suda Fight, with the, uh, which is a remix from Yakuza, uh, Yakuza 5's regular battle theme for Akiyama when facing Akiyama's character Daigoro slash Dibori slash... He's got like four names in this game. Who doesn't in this game? I mean, I honestly. guess that's a little fair. Um, yeah. Eternal Fire, which remixes off of... I forget the name of the track, but it was Saijima's Yakuza 4 battle music. Um, Clash of Our... Uh, Clash of Our Swords, which is a remix of um, Wataze and Katsuya's battle music in uh, Yakuza 5. And most importantly, the song we're talking about, Soar a remix of the final boss of Three Fly, the music of Yoshitaka Mide remixed for Hijikata. And this song kind of does the impossible. Uh, I really like Fly. On its own, it's probably my favorite final boss track, but I can't put it on any yeah. final boss track list because this song somehow manages to improve upon it. Yeah, that's pretty crazy about it. Yeah. And 
not only it improves upon it, but it also recontextualizes it. It does. Uh, because of the change in instrument and era, of course, mm -hmm. but also the change in relation between the, between the character you play and this one when you're actually fighting, because that is not a final boss fight anymore. No, it's, it's a sparring a match. A sparring match between friends yeah. at this point. Um... <laughs> hashtag how yakuza 3 should have ended um yeah honestly the more i look back on isha the more i realize how much of that game is a giant subtweet to a lot of the franchise there is a lot it's of incredible. moments here where it's like oh that's why you recontextualize it this way hey what if we made mirei park sympathetic right actually <laughs> someone figured that out likewise <sighs> what if aizawa was properly dunked on like he should have been yeah. Um, the final boss of five had no business being the final boss of five. And one of the most iconic moments in Ishin is telling the character played by the final boss of five that he's not worth Ryoma's time. And I'm just like, in retrospect, that would have been such a moment. And I regret not knowing that at the time. Yeah, and what if instead of having these characters uh, go from three seconds of friendship to uh, suddenly their enemies... What if instead we've removed that angst and made them hate each other from the very start? Yeah. Um, and that song and, uh, is. And that song Izo for that final boss fight with Izo is actually also a remix of One's final boss, which I was not aware of at the time. Exactly. Um, but and it feels so much more earned. It feels so much more earned. Um, and the music plays into that. Like, again, getting back to Soar. The recontextualization yeah. of the um the recontextualization of the song itself doesn't actually uh reflect I don't think in the intensity of the song because while the relationship is recontextualized that these guys are actually chill um yeah. the song itself that is inc doesn't mean yeah the song itself is incredibly intense reflecting each other. yeah reflecting that the battle is incredibly intense I've really fallen in love with Soar as a song. It may be one of my favorite songs in the entire franchise. Uh, again, if I don't have Pledge of Demon in the conversation, that song just needs to be removed whenever I assess anything. Because, again, yeah. I called Ishin's soundtrack weak, and in retrospect, it may be one of my favorite soundtracks of the entire franchise as a whole. Like, there's so much subtlety, so much going on here. Also, as it turns out, it's the game that gave us Fiercest Warrior, which after this game became the Amon Clan of Superboss's theme, and they just remix it game after game. And it's a very good theme to remix, and the Amon Clan kind of needed that. Yes, um, especially given it used not really a generic boss, but a rare boss in 3. It used the exact same song in 4, and then it just reused some other random track in five. And I'm just like, these are your super bosses. Could you put in some effort? Yakuza, uh, Yakuza oh, series. Eventually they did. You got it. Here's Fiercest Warrior, which is now going to be one of our signature songs. Exactly. Um. So, yeah. Uh. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of needed to talk about Sora. I need to talk about Asian soundtrack as a whole. Largely because there'd be just no avenue to do so as Year of the Dragon continues. And as I learn more yeah. about this franchise and learn more about this song, because we're just not going to be talking about Ishin again in any real way. Um, also, I just want to slip it like that. This also feels like a final stage in a Royal Strike at times. It kind of does. Um, the use of the, of the Bakamatsu era instruments mixing in with the hard rock works surprisingly yeah. well. And that's the exactly. sort of trick that the Warriors franchise likes using. Like, there's a Very lot of Shamisen so. going on in the Samurai Warriors soundtrack, as an example. Love it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, this track is a real standout, and I'm glad it exists, and I'm glad I'm getting a chance to talk about it in full, because that opportunity would not otherwise exist. And the fact that I'm getting a lot of this off my chest feels good. So I think I've said my piece on Soar. This was kind of a long speech, so shall we move let's, on? Let's move on and move up to Death Mountain, then. Yes, indeed. Death Mountain from The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds, which released ten years ago, and I am turning into dust. Oh, god, I'm old. Yeah. Seriously, Link Between but, Worlds was ten years ago? 
2013. Oh, that hurts me. It hurts me too. Uh, but uh, angst and uh, existential dread aside, mm -hmm. I don't know uh, if you're but, gonna go for existential dread. This song's a pretty good soundtrack for it. Well, it's less existential dread and more dread about rocks about to fall screw in your head. I mean, there's definitely danger of falling rocks in this area, that's for sure. Exactly. Actually, no, it's... that's the... That's the Light World version. Or at least the Super yeah. Nintendo version. I don't know. I, I don't actually remember this part of... I remember the Rhinoxes were there were awful. No, no, the, that also includes, uh, in the original at least... Uh, the Falling Rocks part. Uh, in the Light World, the yeah, not in the Dark World. Dead, yes, in the Light World. Yeah, but the Light World just plays your standard Zelda theme. It doesn't actually have this music. This is this is exclusive to Dark World. I need to play A Link to the Past again. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is A Link Between Worlds, the sequel of many years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really worked with a lot of tracks to uh, kind of first stretch their legs and uh, again do this work of expanding what the original track offers and uh, in this case go forth a little bit of a faster pace and a stronger intensity it feels looming and ominous and uh, like you're really fighting the mountain itself yeah. Um, now, there's two versions of this song on the Link Between Worlds soundtrack, and you picked the one that feels yeah. more like... I compared this one to a uh, franchise we talked about a couple times, and that's Lufia Curse of the Sinistrals, uh, which remixed Lufia to Rise of the Sinistrals uh, pretty much in its entirety. And this feels more like that situation. There's another version of this song on that soundtrack that's live orchestrated, which I believe plays... Either before or after, like, you're heading to Turtle Rock. Um, uh, well, there are likely, like, I think three versions of each song, because there's uh, the version you get right there, there's mm -hmm. a version you get after some major event, like the overworld tracks change mm -hmm. when you pick up the Master Sword, or when you do... Uh, uh, I think collect some of the doodads in uh, the dark parallel world of low rule. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the milk bar version. Oh, right, the milk bar version. I forgot about that for a second. Uh, yeah. Fun because fact. this game loves its soundtrack so much, it introduces as a pretty central feature the ability to just have versions with two instruments of each of their main songs, once you've listened to them in the real world. Well, in the game world. Uh, so, fun fact, uh, the CD I actually got off of eBay for this album was scratched. Mm -hmm. So I had to oh. actually run around and, like, pirate, sorry to say, the milk bar versions of this music, because otherwise I couldn't actually listen to it on the CD that I paid money for. Yeah, and it'd be a shame, because some of them... Again, go in a different di direction they and do. look almost like a what if version of uh, here's how uh, how else we could have remixed those tracks. Yeah. Um, now, this actually weirdly ties into um, the April Fool's episode because one of the songs that I drew, actually, I think for you, was Link Between the Worlds Dark World orchestrated theme. So, towards the end of the game, I believe it was the orchestrated yeah. one and not the, not the synth one. Yes. I keep wanting to say uh, the word think. MIDI here. That is wrong, and I know that is wrong, but that's the word that wants to come out of my mouth. I have to stop myself every time. I feel you. Uh, but yeah, no, that's... Uh, I mean, first, that's the first one I stumbled on, and mm -hmm. uh, honestly, it feels like it does the job well enough. It's the one you hear in-game when you're going through the mountain. For the first time, and uh, it just suffices to establish uh, kind of uh, heightened intensity and almost, it feels almost like they gave life to uh, 
the original music the way you listened to it, uh, the way I listened to it as a kid, and then processed it and expanded it in my head yeah. over the course of the next 20 years. Yeah, this was a very faithful soundtrack in all the right ways. Like, again, like, between this and the Link's Awakening remake, like, this is how you remake Zelda. Yeah. Um, it pays enormous credit, but still does its own thing. Like, the original track it has, like, Yuga's theme, are also on that level. Yeah, no, the, uh, I, I still get Lowro Castle kind of stuck in my head on occasion, because it is yeah. also quite, quite good. Though Laurel Castle also has the bonus of having a sample and apart from the original Dark World Castle reversed as part of that song. Yes. Um, Which is just b a beautiful piece of trickery in an already amazing track by itself. Yeah. Uh, I got a like, lot of love this... for the Link Between Worlds soundtrack. I'm not going to sit here yeah, pretend otherwise. And... And I think this game shows a lot of love for the series it's from. Yeah. Um, it's a labor of love in many ways, and that shows in most of the track. I, I think it's fair to I, say. I'm going to be honest. I, I am not a Breath of the Wild fan. I have no interest in playing Tears of the Kingdom. But I at least understand why people enjoy it. Yeah, I just exactly. hope like that style, especially with its more minimalistic music bent doesn't outright replace classic Zelda. Like, I would love a fresh exactly. classic or 3D Zelda game because, let's be honest, pretty much every one of those games has one of these soundtracks that kind of jumps out at you, and Breath of the Wild demonstrably does not. Yes. Um. So I'm really hoping we still get... I, I'm really hoping there's still room in Nintendo's heart for some of this. Their increasingly yeah, black exactly. and evil heart. Yeah, like... At the time this released, I think part of what helped it was the fact that they had the main console, and then they had their side console in which they could afford to do mm -hmm. something that's more retro and not trying to reinvent the series, but just to pay homage to it. Yeah. And, and the fact they're on, locked on a single system right now kind of constrains them, I feel. Um, yeah, it constrains them, it constrains their development resources. Now, admittedly, uh, uh, Link's Awakening, I with believe, came exception, back. With one exception, with one exception, that is the port of the uh, Game Boy game. Yeah, I was about to say, like, I believe Link's Awakening yes. came out between the two Breath of the Wild games. Yeah, exactly, but that one very much feels like it's uh, a DS game that uh, got, uh, that landed, like, it feels like a DS project that landed on the Switch. Yes. Um, and I will admit... Uh, and I say that as a positive. Oh, say I love so many games of the 3DS. No, 3DS was a great system. Uh, I just hated the fact that it was handheld. So the fact that I can play this one yeah, on console exactly. is excellent. Um, Honestly, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah, I... Ha. Ha. Um, Proud of this one. I, I believe you. Honestly, um... Telltale Mountains was another one of my, from Link's Awakening, was another one of my thought processes on this episode, but I just had it against it because I'm pretty sure I talked about that specific song before. Um, so good on you for still bringing Zelda in the mix, because anytime I can speak positively about Zelda, it just makes me feel good inside. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a good series, and for how much it's in the forefront of... Uh... No, you like video games, so you like Zelda. It feels like kind of a default game in a lot of ways. It is, but... but... that doesn't mean every game in the series has uh, this feel, and I feel like A Link Between Worlds is in a very unique place. It is. Um... As a long-lost direct sequel, as a love letter that does so many new things, it's... Yeah. It has a place near and dear to my heart. Very much same. Uh, in fact, my 3DS was specifically the Link Between Worlds 3DS, and I still have it around here somewhere. Ah, mine is the Fire Emblem Awakening one. Well, we're not going to be talking about Fire Emblem just yet. That comes a little later. We got one more of mine to do first. Well, let's do it then. Let's Bring do on it. Bring the Fender. So this was the other song that 
inspired this episode, or at least my recommending it as a topic, and that is a song called Twice Stricken from Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers. Um, now, Remain Me is a bit of a history. Was that the first uh, endgame two that you walked on? Sort of. The okay. answer to that is yes in content, but I did do synced Alexander and synced uh, Coils of Bahamut first. Right, like, not right. fully, but I did them. Yeah, but that's the first right piece of fresh, yeah. on-level, recently released content. Yes, uh, my very first, like, this content is happening right now, and the next patch will increase the tier list was, in fact, this exact fight. This was Eden 5. Yeah, um, because I feel like this uh, kind of matters the first, fa the first time you are uh, doing some in-game content. I strongly believe that uh, I wouldn't be nearly as attached to uh, the Sephiroth battle music if it wasn't for this being my situation, kind of. Um... I'm not even sure I am really attached to this song compared to some of the others. Like, I like Blinding Indigo, which is E3, Return to Oblivion, which is E8, um, hmm. a lot better. But Interesting. But this song is the one that came to mind for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, the last episode we... The, the, sorry, the last song we talked about was related to the April Fool's episode. This was almost my pick for Purple for my April Fool's follow-up, where we actually talk about the real topics. Um, yeah, I can see that. Right, uh, and secondly, when I think internal remix, this is kind of the one that goes the farthest when it comes to the Eden fights. Um, yes. Except maybe Primal Angel, which kind of goes in the opposite direction. It's not as intensive as either of the songs that it remixes. Yeah. Um, whereas this, this one, one... changes the pace completely. Yeah, Thunder Rolls is this kind of meditative, contemplative, almost chill track for a boss fight. Whereas this one just hits you in the face with Mjolnir, effectively, a hammer of lightning. Um, exactly. So Eden's remix is a lot more intense, both in battle and in music. Um, so it's kind of the first one I think of when I think of internal remixes, because it is so wildly different. Yeah. They went, I feel, explicitly with a counterpoint. Yes. Um, and I think that works for this song in ways that kind of don't really need to be talked about in others. Like, I mentioned Blinding Indigo, which is Leviathan. I like that song, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really grow over the original, um, over the original Leviathan music. Um. Yeah, I think, and, uh, heads up, pun unintended for the series. Uh-oh. They have, a, they have a lot of song, meaning they have a lot of song titles, but this track feels more less like a remix and more like an answer. Yeah, you know what? I agree with that. It's definitely, it's definitely a counter-argument to the original. Original Ramu was chill. Eden Ramu has no chill. Yeah, it feels like the previous one was talking about the character of Ramu, and this one is talking about the actual fight, yeah. which was, even in the first encounter, already a bit of a cluster F. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a lot going on. Chasing orbs is fun. And to FF14's credit, even they do that. Um, if in The dialogue the tree orbs, going into the orbs. scene. No, that was the landslides, the landslides. In in this one, oh, I yes. remember it was like, uh, it was it was something like, I spent a lot of time chasing orbs, not always successfully, and I'm like, boy, that is the original experience of that oh, fight, yeah. isn't it? And another answer, I believe, described uh, Ramu as uh, a vegetable with uh, a beard, and then... <laughs> no, it was... It was half like, man, was half beard, half and another half beard again, or something like that. Exactly, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like... Th that is the answer I picked at that time, but that other one always stuck to my mind, as in, like, yeah, that's the gameplay answer. I believe for Titan yeah. I did actually answer the landslides the landslides, because that is definitely my experience <laughs> with that fight. Um, yeah, well, so... That was the first hard mode fight my uh, FC leader dragged me to, so... Oh, dear. I'd, 
to this day I still have a specific warning sound effect associated with getting under his belt <laughs> because of the knockback. Yup. Um so yeah, um so this song to me is more proof of concept than what I actually like listening to. Though it is one of the songs I can listen to the easiest because this is one that made it to a mount and several of the others didn't. Um yeah. And then one recent mount came out that didn't have the boss's music on it, which makes me just incredibly angry because I would pay money for it if it did. Absolutely. Um, anyway, getting back to this particular song, I really like what this one does. Um, it just delivers synth It's got bombs. electricity. Put a lot of electric sounds. Yeah, and it does. Um, the Eden soundtrack as a whole is very largely synth heavy. I think, I think owing yeah. to the remix idea of it. Yeah, it almost feels like it goes halfway between what uh, the actual game soundtrack does and what the Pulse album does. Yeah. Yeah, it's very reminiscent of what would become the Pulse album. Um, so, like, while there are other songs I would rather listen to, when it comes to internal remixes and how to do them right and really create a transformative experience, as we've been talking about several times over this episode, um, this is kind of the first song that comes to mind. Um, yeah, it's very transformative. It yeah. still keeps track of... Uh... The elements that uh, composed the original one, but yeah. I think the fact that it has the original that is has such a long lead up and for most of its length such a small amount of elements that stand out to you, yeah, uh, means that they could add a lot of stuff uh, to it and have it work without being overly busy. It's a bit messy, but it feels like a mess you're trying to control and barely hold it Yeah. To, which is how those fights work. Which is how those fights work. Especially that one uh, in Savage. That's got so much going on. That's just like, there's so much on the screen at any given time. It almost feels like, at least visually, a late stage Savage fight. So the fact that the music is so much more intense kind of compounds that sense of anxiety this gives you. Um, yeah. which I think is a sign of a really well-crafted boss remix. Like, it's definitely selling the energy that it wants to give the player. Absolutely. Um. He doesn't try to lull you into a false sense of serenity like the original. Yeah. The original, like, I'm, I'm kind of opposed to that song. Like, I don't dislike it, but I'm kind of opposed to it as a boss track because it's too chill. Honestly, it's kind of part of my problem with Equilibrium, Sophia's boss theme, for kind of a similar reason. Like, at no point do I really get the impression it's a boss music. It's just a good song. I kind of on Equilibrium specifically, mostly because it feels like it focuses on the kind of grandiose theme of it all more than uh, the, uh, like, Ramu feels just meditative. Yeah. This one feels like kind of the bus showing off in its own way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do like Equilibrium, I do like the song, I just, um, I don't know, I never, I never yeah, found but, it was very appropriate like for boss the music, song yeah. and making it as a bus song. Yeah, those are two different I mean, things. for the Greatest gap in that, we can just talk about the near raid. <laughs> Here we go again, is right. That's the title of this episode. I'm like, I, you you can hear me scream Eddie about that. Eddie's in there, we can. Yeah, well, we, we had a, I had a whole episode on this. It's like what we would have done differently if that was literally my topic was Tower of Paradigm's Breach. And I'm like, you messed up here, you messed up here, you messed up here, you messed up here. Um, yeah. I don't think we need to go through that again. We have an episode on that. I'm sure it can be found on YouTube. Um, Absolutely. But the point here is that I feel some some tracks can be very good by themselves, but yeah. are disputable. To they don't really match the energy of an actual raid fight. Yeah, and I do definitely believe that uh, the original version of the song "Thunder Rolls" is on that list, probably premiere on that list for this franchise. Yeah, uh, where is this song? And, twice uh, stricken. Twice stricken very much isn't. Very much isn't. This is a boss song, and it's a very very good yes. boss song. Um, 
You know, we were talking about the Primal concert for the Fan Festa a couple years ago. Um, and we talked about uh, Blinding Indigo just being a pretty much straight up just update to Leviathan, which I think is, again, a fairly yeah. reasonable take on it. Um, this doesn't feel nearly as iterative. This feels... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like a fresh beast inspired by something from back in, and I think that is exactly what they were it going for. I think they succeeded fresh. very admirably. Yeah. And, uh... You know, I have a weird transition for this, so if you'll indulge me. Um, on By the subject of remixes, today before this episode, I actually finally listened to, um... P12S Phase 2, which is a remix of uh, Ultimus Perfection from Final Fantasy Tactics. Not mm -hmm. not exactly an internal remix, but it was used during the... Um, it was used during uh, the Evil East Raids as the final boss yeah. was that actual song from Tactics. Um, the, uh, the, the P12S Mark 2, or Phase 2 song version doesn't actually sound like Hitoshi Sakimoto's work in any meaningful way. It, it it still uses his melody lines, but it sounds extremely divorced from the original in ways that I actually find kind of awkward. I don't really like this song that much. And then your last pick... Actually... Yeah, you literally asked me if it was his work. Yeah, because it sounds like his flourishes that were missing from this other weirdo song. So by all means, let's talk about it. <laughs> all right. Because that's probably... Maybe not my favorite, but my most interesting pick of uh, this uh, whole set, I feel. Yeah. It's a Trial of the Pact from Fire Emblem Engage OST. Right. Fire Emblem Engage being the one that released this year. And it's very much a celebration game that has as part of uh, its flow uh, levels for each of the protagonists of the previous uh, like 15 Fire Emblems. <clears throat> Actually, it's 14, I think. That one is the 15th. And what's interesting is that, of course, for each of those stages, they do uh, a remix version of one of the original uh, noteworthy tracks. So at first I was considering looking at this way, but I feel this one is the most interesting because... Uh, uh, over the course of the previous levels and the previous protagonists' uh, games you explore in this game, uh, they have a pretty unified way to remix the tracks, to uh, kind of give them this nostalgic feeling to it. Right. By having a lot of wind instruments, by having a lot of long drawn out notes, to, and. Uh, a relatively low percussion, although that is also explained by the fact that there is a transition from a field theme to a bell theme and back and forth. Right. Uh, but then they have this one, which is uh, the special level you unlock near the end to get uh, the engagement ring uh, you can give to a character. And as a result, that is kind of a nostalgia level for the Fire Emblem protagonist of the Fire Emblem game you are currently playing. And so what it does is that it kind of works this nostalgia remix version, mm -hmm. not of another, tra another game's uh, tracks, but of this very game. And go from one track to the next. There's multiple tracks that are referenced, although there is... Uh, one uh, common level that is uh, the main through line and uh, it's a very interesting way to do it that works very well I feel it kind of inscribes it in as uh, not only a reference to the history of the games before it but as part of that history it has a feel of acceptance to it right um now, I'm not nearly as familiar with the franchise or the soundtrack of the franchise. Uh, the only yes. Fire Emblem game I've played to any real significant degree was Fire Emblem Warriors, which does not count. Um, Even though it is, uh, if uh, 
three hopes is any indication pretty good. I liked Fire Emblem Warriors. I thought that was a pretty solid Dynasty Warriors game. Uh, yeah. It did a lot right. A little heavy on the moveset clones, which is something I thought they'd kind of moved away from, especially given how Hyrule Warriors worked, which was its immediate predecessor. But um, I'm not as familiar. So I, 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 I'm not as familiar with the soundtrack as a whole, but I am at least somewhat familiar with at least the remixes that was in Warriors. Um, yeah. I don't believe this song is among them. Uh, or at the very well, least, well, no, it... because this game didn't release yet. Okay, so this is actually a remix of something original to this game. Yes, exactly. Uh... Like this is a remix of an engaged track. Aha! Uh -huh. I didn't quite get that. As I see, yeah, okay. no, that's what I mean by it inscribes itself in the history of its predecessors. Is that it is played like a nostalgia track, but is a remix of. A track that is in this very game and that originated from this very game. Yeah. Okay. Interesting take. Um, yeah. Now, I, I, I did mention when I asked you, like, there were some, like, orchestral flourishes uh, that definitely sounded like the kind of thing Sakimoto likes doing with his arrangements. And I'm like, it definitely doesn't sound like his composition style, but a couple of these sweeps are right out of his playbook, so I did have to ask you if this was Sakimoto, and we confirmed that he had nothing to do with it. Um, Indeed. But it does have this fundamentally... It works very well as a music for a tactics game. Yeah. And I think if you're going to dis decide what a tactics game sounds like... The two pillars are the Final Fantasy Tactics, Tactics Ogre kind of side, and the Fire Emblem side of it. And this one kind of, I mean, when you put it that way, this one kind of definitely feels like it's blending those in ways that yeah. haven't really been present in prior tracks. At least the few that I've heard. Yeah, this one, partly because I feel of uh, the fact that it's kind of a side story in the game. Uh, more than a uh, main objective, uh, which has the weight of the plot bearing on it. This one feels kind of like a, a bit of a distraction, so you can really focus on one of the main theme of this track, which is you are playing a tactics game. Yep. That is, in a long line of tactics game, you seem to enjoy tactics game. Cool. We too. Yeah, that definitely, I got, I got that impression, now that you put it that way, that definitely the impression the song gives out. So good other composers for, like, making that make sense. Yeah. Like, they got that across that very game, well. That game has a lot of love, and the soundtrack is uh, an unambiguously great part of this game. This is Not the... only the remixes, but, but the originals, too. Yeah, this is the second or third song from the soundtrack you brought me. Or you brought the show, and, uh... And the game is five months old. That says a lot. That says a lot. Yeah. And, I mean, it's part of a series that I like. Like I said, my 3DS is the Fire Emblem Awakening 3DS for a reason. I've never been able to get into it. I played a little bit of a bunch of them, and not even a bunch of them, like three or four of them, and I'm just like, this is not Yeah, it me. is very different from the FFT uh, Tactics Soga yeah. kind of games. Which is definitely the ones I grew up on, and I'm definitely more used to that style. Exactly. Um. Oh my god, I just saw an announcement for another batch of Mercenaries games coming out. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this is so derivative and not very good, but I have a Terrible soft spot for uh, them. It is incredible junk for tactics game. It is incredible junk for a tactics game. No, I meant junk food tactics junk game. Junk food. Oh, yeah, definitely yeah. junk food tactics game, for sure. But I can definitely understand why, you would, why you'd understand it as junk for a tactics game. That, too. Let's just have your character learn every single skill from every class. That they've acquired over the game. <laughs> Watch how that plays. My lists yeah. are gigantic and I can do everything. <laughs> but, um... Anyway, with uh, this uh, kind of self-referential and 
tactics heavy and also kind of a real song in a way. Uh, like it feels a little bit dreamy too with the wind sounds. Yeah. And uh, gives uh, the cements the identity of this game as inherently lighthearted. Yeah, uh, nothing I heard here feels very tense. Exactly. And I feel like the fact this track manages to say so much in a minute 50 without feeling overly busy, yeah, if uh, very fleshed out, very fluffy, but not messy, uh, I respect that a lot. Yeah, same. Uh, even coming at this from an outsider, like everything you, every assessment you've said, I, I can immediately listen to the song and go like, oh, yeah, no, that, that tracks with my own listening experience. And I have not played this game and I have not played this franchise and I'm not familiar. So again, very yeah. much good on the composers for getting that across in a way that even to a first time listener is rather clear. Absolutely. Well, on that note, then, I believe we can... Tactically shift ha. from this set of tracks and remixes to Music Arcade No Playing. You outright stole the intro. I'm not even going to do it. You're just gonna get the. You're just gonna get the theme music. Yeah. Nice. Eddie's away. All the rules are gone. All the rules are gone. Uh, except for the fact that now playing is, like, weirdly short. Am I crazy, or there are just two songs, one from each of us? There are just two songs, one from each of us. Well, uh... I, I guess you go first. Alright, then. It's a Vampire Survivors game! Really? But not literal Vampire Survivors. It is Holds of Torment, which had its full release recently, and, uh, it's... Nailing to a degree I didn't thought would be possible of a Diablo 1 slash quasi Diablo 2 aesthetic. Yeah, no, my I looked at this and I just I didn't realize it was a Warriors game. I thought it was literally like a character select screen for like a Diablo knockoff. And my exact yeah, notes no, it's a were... character select screen with a Diablo uh, uh -huh. knockoff feel, but then thrown into a survival's game genre. I kind of feel like that would go together well. Now I'm now I'm actually kind of intrigued by this game. But yeah, no, my actual I assure you it does. Yeah, my actual note on this is I'm trying so hard to be Diablo because actual Diablo was run by jerks. Yeah. And even like and, the sound uh, of it is like OG case, Diablo. For, like the aesthetics are impeccable to the point where when you're in the game you have enormous UI elements to the left and right in order to make sure the main play area is in four thirds. Oh wow, okay, they're really selling that experience. I might have to check this one out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I highly recommend it. Like, see the guy, uh, top left over the middle, mostly dressed in black? I am not watching the video right now, because that'll come across on the stream. Oh, right. Uh, but on the thumbnail, there's a uh, there's a guy like that, kind of looks like a Plague Doctor. Uh... uh his main weapon is a flamethrower. <laughs> okay. Sure. Can a game uh, with that look can truly be bad when it has a character ready to flamethrow anything? No, I say. Not at all. The game's good. The soundtrack isn't really standing out to the point where... There's, it's not a vampire survival miracle where some tracks like, say, Libro Inferno are on the level of uh, a Castlevania track. Like, there's no track on uh, in Halls of Torment that matches the energy of uh, Tristran's theme. Right. But it's doing a pretty good in impression of uh, some of the, like... The catacombs level, for instance. Yeah. That feels like the vibe they cemented around, and it works pretty well. I, um... Weirdly enough, the thing you just said about the Plague Doctor, can it truly be bad? Reminds me of one of the daily quests uh, from Mr. Pandaria, another Blizzard property. Yeah. Um, where you are given a flamethrower, and uh, you're, you have to blow up bug dust with it. Um... One of the things I always found funny is if you talk to a quest giver again, usually they'll give you a hint. 
This particular one got very snarky and went, I don't know what needs to be explained here. You point the bad end of the thing and make the problem go away. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's a very I mean, good way of putting it. it's a flammenwerfer. It works flammen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I actually even did understand that. Mostly because of the overabundance of World War II games out there. Ah, I see. Just referencing a, a meme. Uh... But yeah, Hosts of Torment. Music is alright. The game's very fun. Okay. I know I've a third survivors like game in my tool belt. Very cool. Now, for a game we both played and enjoyed. Yes, I like this game very much. Uh, Baby's first 4X game. Uh, so I've been watching a lot of Spiffing Brit and a lot of his associated acts like Potato McWhiskey and Real Civil Engineer at points. I figured the timing was much in that. It was. Uh, one of the things they've been playing is a game called Terraformers, which is like Baby's first 4X. Uh, it's a very, like, chill, almost 4X, though it's missing the combat elements, which makes me feel good because I've never been good at combat in that regard. But it's just this space management, you know, we're terraforming Mars. Here's a bunch of mild roguelike elements that help expand that. And they're actually very short playthroughs. Like, you can get to the beginning and the end of your win condition in about an hour and a half on a longer game, which feels... Good. It feels like a good size. As you said, it's it's one of the reasons it's good is because the game actually ends. It's not like Stellaris yeah. or Civ Six, which could take forever. Yeah, exactly. This one is um, though manageable. As for the music, it exists. I I don't have much positive to say about this music. Uh, it's there. I don't have much negative to say about it. It's it's there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's very uh, bite size. It's manageable. It feels mm -hmm. like. You can just sit down, take an hour, do most of that game, return to it, and you have few enough choices that you can actually take, resume a game, f draw it to a finish, get a few unlocks, and have you have a little fun this way. Yeah, it's a great comfort game. It's a great comfort game. I like I like putting it like that. It's a very chill experience. It's a very chill game. Um. It's challenging, but it's not overly punishing. Yeah. If you're doing stuff, you're probably get, getting somewhere. Yep. And uh, turning the red planet blue feels good. It does. I love I love space management. I love Mars. Uh, you know, I had uh, I had uh, Bobby Draper's MMC chant from The Expanse running through my head as I was as I was putting this up. But um, yeah, and I feel like the devs. Love Mars as well, if only judging by uh, the music, because it has this very uh, future optimism vibe to it. You know, I found the music to be incredibly generic. I, I'm i not super thrilled with the soundtrack. I find myself comparing it to Ixion, another space management sim, though a yeah. far more difficult and punishing one. <laughs> Um, and a grim one, too. And a grim one, but the music in that game is actually, like, legitimately great. Um, yeah, this one, it's it's not that much, it, it won't stick in your head after yeah. you're done playing the game. Yeah. But when it's there, it's nice. It gets the job done. Like, I'm not angry at its existence. It's it's fine. Exactly. It's fine music. It's it's music that exists. It's positive. I don't hate you, it, don't love You it. are doing space things on the red planet where democracy still exists. Yep. Yep. That's a way to put it. Hey, there's elections. There are elections. Um, and in fact, I got far enough in a game where I actually ran out of unique heroes, and it even says, like, the age of visionaries is over, and things have kind of gotten to normalcy, and here's who's getting elected. I first switched that on that last game I did as well. Though, in my defense, it was on Insanity level 817 or something. Yeah, I haven't gotten quite to that point yet. I'm still kind of learning the game. I've only played it for a couple of days. Yeah, you you uh, don't have some of the uh, 4X uh, kind of resource management yeah. uh, habits. And that's kind of why I'm glad that I started with this one. Um, it's an excellent stepping stone. <clears throat> exactly. Like, a game like 
Stellaris, which I'm very interested in for a lot of the same reasons. Space! Um, a game like another game that I was very interested in, Empire of Sin, which is, you know, Prohibition Simulator. Yeah. Um, those feel very daunting by comparison. Those have just gigantic much, systems. And I've, I am honestly impressed by how much Paradox, which at the point Sterilis first released, was very much an inaccessible kind of uh, publisher and uh, yeah. developer too, I think. I, I think anyway, they're product a, I think they're a developer umbrella. umbrella, like they own like sub teams. I see, I see, yeah. And so like your Crusader Kings and your Hearts of Iron uh -huh. all feel very impenetrable. Uh but they've managed to make Stellaris a lot more accessible to the point where it kind of matches the level of uh, your galactic civilizations or yeah. your uh other games uh, in the genre, Imperium Galactica, for a more retro example. Uh, and that's pretty impressive on that part. And then, of course, they re overcomplicated over everything by adding 17 different packs of DLC. Yeah, I... Uh, that's another issue. On a recent Steam sale, I bought, like, a, like five packs that I think came with the bundle. <laughs> that was enough. I... I... Maybe yeah. we'll buy more, but, like, it depends on how yeah, good the game is. For now, I don't need to worry about that, because Terraformers is actually, like, it's it, it's complicated enough to get me starting to think in those, like, more expansive terms, but without being yeah. overly, and like, aggressive about it, which I appreciate. Very much. Like, it feels satisfying to play. It doesn't yeah. feel like you're playing the baby's first 4X, even if you are. Right, and I really do appreciate that. Yeah. It manages to make something simple, but not dull. And yes. That's a good balance. I, I really like this game. I really like this game. I'm glad I tried it. I'm glad I'm playing it. I'm probably going to play it some more, assuming I... And I look forward to additional content they may release. Oh, are... They've announced three sets of DLC. Are they going to do so? They are, yes. Yes! It's going to be three packs of content. They have announced that. In February, I believe. Hooray! So yeah, that's going to be even more Terraformers to refresh a little bit the things uh, if uh, the regular unlocks uh, start running dry after a while. Great! Good stuff. Yeah, no, I, I'd be happy to get more of this game. I think this is a game that has some room for expansion, because right now some of my games feel a little samey. Yeah. Um. So a little more, a little more variety might be nice. Yeah, a few bits of uh, breaks uh, during a marathon, especially. It's nice. Yeah. To have a few uh, points of comfort. It is. It absolutely is. And then is. get back to uh, the other fun games with renewed interest and renewed energy. Except for that dancing mini game, which I still can't wrap my head around. I. Can't blame you because I will talk about that in the. We'll next, talk about that uh, year in the, the next year podcast. of the Dragon Podcast. And because, as you might imagine, I have rhythm game thoughts. I believe you, and I'm looking forward to Not hearing them. Not all of them. them as negative as you might ex expect, though. Um, I'm just, yeah. You know what? We will save it for then. And all right. With that, that is all the time we have for this. Very, like, kind of thrown together, but still very interesting episode of Music Arcade. Uh, as always, you can find uh, links to the songs we talked about and uh, how to contact us in the description below. And until next time, everybody, keep on mixing. See ya.